Welcome to another phone show review with extraneous noises from lockdown Britain I despair. We've got helicopters, we've got gardeners, but on with the tech. You may remember the fairly recent Sony Xperia 1 Mark II. It was large, it was heavy, it had a screen that was so crazily high resolution you effectively couldn't even read it outdoors. It had a telephoto camera that produces muddy images, yet I still found lots to like, not least because it ticked every single box in anybody's wish list. Large battery, wireless charging, loud stereo speakers, 3.5mm jack, excellent main camera, super fast processor, lots of RAM, lots of flash storage, plus micro SD. But the Xperia 1 II was clearly flawed and all eyes then turned to a smaller future sister device, this, the Xperia 5 Mark II, which fixes a lot of what the 1 Mark II got wrong. Now there was an original Xperia 5, of course, almost identical in form factor and with slightly older internals. The main difference aside from chipset is that the original followed one modern trend by ditching an audio jack and haha, Sony brought it back for the Mark II, yay. Now that's what I call listening to its users. Essentially, this is a cinematic, i.e. 21 by 9 displayed Android flagship with surprisingly compact and fully water and dustproof form factor, sliding into any pocket and grippable, however small your hand. Yet inside is a full Snapdragon 865 with 8GB of RAM, 128GB of storage, plus micro SD. This super wide display is 120Hz, 6.1 inch OLED affair at 1080p, and by sticking to that resolution, the contrast outdoors is a lot better than on the One Mark II, meaning that you can make more of the, well, the rather good cameras here, which is a great relief. I should note that the 5 Mark II's display is still, well, dimmer and less contrasty than on my Samsung Apple phones here, but it's worlds better than its larger sister screen, so that's good. There's an optional always on display with clock, date, notifications, though there are also plenty of halfway smart options of this to help save battery. Most Android applications are just fine with a 21 by 9 display, though I did note that YouTube sometimes doesn't know what to do with it by default, so you occasionally get black bars all round. You would expect the video to fill the screen vertically, but it doesn't, so sometimes you have to multi-touch zoom manually. And all is then well, though I'm still going to be eyeing the Play Store for a YouTube client update. The stereo speakers are a highlight for me personally. They're terrific with all frequencies coming from both the earpiece and the bottom end and both front facing. In fact, they're so good that activating Dolby Atmos off by default doesn't always make the sound better. There's enough bass and top end and physics that the software tricks they really aren't needed. This is full volume, no Dolby. It's for a five mark two. Sony adds its unique dynamic vibration system, effectively driving a large haptic vibrator in time to the bass frequencies in a soundtrack. So you feel the sound in the body of the phone when holding it, especially impressive when watching Netflix or similar. There are three different amplitudes to play with, or you can just turn the system off if you don't like it. Sound via the audio jack is okay. It's straight from the DAC in the main chipset, so no frills, but it's good enough for most people. And it's just nice to have a, an audio jack back on another flagship smartphone always useful as a backup or to play with pro audio accessories including mixing desks, microphones. There's a lot going on with imaging in Sony's pro level handsets this year. As with the One Mark II we have a triple camera with three times stabilised telephoto except that for the Five Mark II Sony has fixed it and zoomed images are just fine. This was a One Mark II weak point. See all the stills examples here across the three cameras. All are 12 megapixel iPhone style f over 1.7 for the main lens, f over 2.4 for the telephoto, and f over 2.2 for the ultra wide lens. Though unlike on the iPhone, you can't smoothly zoom between the three focal lengths. Here, you have to explicitly choose the 24mm, the 70mm or the 16mm lenses, make an artistic choice, and then stick with it through any multi-touch or UI zooming. Yes, there are some white balance differences between the lenses, but every other phone with multiple cameras on the planet allows auto lens switching, so it's odd that Sony doesn't. So as with the Xperia 1 Mark II, the 5 Mark II, you can zoom in by swiping on the UI, but only within the one lens. This is up to three times zoom within the one lens. Then you have to stop and then switch lenses 
<laughs> this is not ideal for continuous zoom, but I guess you make your creative decisions at the time. This is uh, the, the three times telephoto and zooming in to about three times on that, so about nine times in all. All at 1080p here for the phone show, of course. And now back on the main lens here at one times. High quality stereo sound, a very pro feel to the whole thing, but uh, you do have to put some thought into it. You also get Cinema Pro and Photo Pro apps preloaded. These are clearly add-ons in that you have to explicitly allow them access to the phone storage and camera when first started. But they work well enough to mimic a Sony Alpha DSLR in terms of controls for video and photo work. I've played with both and I've got a folder of abortive, overexposed, out-of-focus experiments for my trouble. I'm sure a Sony DSLR old hand would leap into these user interfaces, spend minutes, tens of minutes setting up each shot and they get great results. But with all my existing imaging experience, I still haven't got the time, patience or indeed skill it seems. Still, you don't have to use these apps. Under the hood, the Snapdragon 865 is fast and fine. Though I did note that Sony's a bit behind with its OS updates. It's currently November 2020 as I record this and the Xperia 5 Mark II is stuck on, wait for it, Android 10's August security, which is a little worrying for a new flagship. Come on Sony, keep up. The battery is 4,000 milliamp hours, which is very decent considering how diminutive the Xperia 5 Mark II is. It easily lasts a full day, even with some camera and media use in my experience. Charging is at up to 21 watts via power delivery 3.0. Fast enough for most people, surely, though. I was a bit disappointed to see that there's no room here for a Qi wireless coil. That was present in the larger one Mark II. I'd have happily accepted another millimetre of depth for Qi charging. 5G is supported here, of course, though, as with the iPhone 12 in the previous phone show, it's way too early to review 5G in real life in most corners of the world. The notable thing here is that sub-6 5G is supported and that your new handset is good to go in your hands, or perhaps a family member's, for future coverage for the next decade. Maybe it's the jack and the good stereo speakers that are swaying me here, but I really, really enjoyed my time with the Xperia 5 Mark II. Sony has got almost everything right in terms of specs and balance. The one exception, other than lack of Qi charging, is perhaps price. As I record this, the phone is a whopping £800 in the UK, including VAT, which outside the Apple ecosystem and outside Samsung's current follies, is still a little pricey. You're paying for the cutting edge chip, the storage, the camera goodies, the IP68 rating, I get all that. I can see how the costs mount up, but I think £700, i.e. 699 would sit far better in the phone world and make the Xperia 5 Mark II something aspirational to recommend to the man in the street. As it is, it's more a real find for the cognoscenti. That's you. The stunningly good Xperia 5 Mark II.